Intelligence, part two. So now we're going to talk about the other extremes of intelligence, the higher end. Gifted children, despite popular beliefs, are well-adjusted, successful adults. Uh, gifted programs are supposed to get the same money as special services. So like the AP program, IB program that you guys belong to, the, you're supposed to get the same services as um, students who are in special needs classes. Now that doesn't always happen because they need more help than you guys. So even though you're supposed to get the same, you know, it falls kind of under the same umbrella. It doesn't really happen. And we're, you know, gifted children sometimes because they think differently, depending on, you know, gifted. So we're talking about above 130 IQ. A lot of times people think that, you know, they're odd and that, you know, they're maybe a little socially awkward. Um, but actually, you know, when they become adults, they actually usually become very successful. So that's like a stereotype that they have that isn't necessarily true. Proponents of intelligence. So savant syndrome. Individuals with remarkable but rare talent, even though they're mentally deficient in other areas. So if you're a savant, it means like you're a genius at something. And there is a few videos I'll show you of different savants. And, you know, it's just amazing what they're able to do. So four out of five savants are males. And many also have the autism spectrum disorder, ASD. And there's, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but it's almost like their brain is wired. So they're said to have like an extremely male brain if you have autism. And... which means you tend to think very, it's like a left brain type person, very logical, but your brain, it just kind of focuses on the one thing and kind of neglects the other thing. So they tend to be more socially awkward. An example of this would be Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. If you've ever seen it, it's an old movie, I think from the nineties with Dustin Hoffman, that's him in the picture there and Tom Cruise. And Dustin Hoffman is a, uh, a savant. He has autism and he kind of annoys Tom Cruise, who's his brother. And so like in one scene, he tells him to read the, the phone book. We used to have these things called phone books with everyone's phone numbers in them back in the day. And so he does this and they go out to like breakfast the next day and their waitress, you know, Sally, whoever. And then he goes, Sally, and then like reads off his, her uh, phone number because he literally memorized the entire phone book on that. One of the videos I'll show you that I'll post on the playlist is actually uh, the, a guy named Kim Peeks, and the movie Rain Man was actually based off of him. So autism spectrum disorder. A disorder that appears in childhood and is marked by significant deficiencies in communication and social interaction and by rigidly fixated interests and repetitive behaviors. And so the numbers on this are always changing. So a new government survey of parents suggests that one in 45 children ages 3 through 17 have been diagnosed with autism. Uh, and ASD, so, you know, it's a, one of the things to point out is it's a spectrum disorder. So they used to call it, uh, they'd have different names for it depending on the range of it. Like Asperger's was a higher functioning person with autism. Now it's just a spectrum, right? So you fall somewhere on the spectrum. And it does vary a lot depending on where you fall on it. So this is notably higher than the official government estimate of one in 68 American children with autism by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which is the CDC, uh, which after the pandemic, most people are very familiar with now. And like we said previously, well, actually, so four out of five savants tend to be males and four out of five, um, or sorry, four out of five savants tend to have autism and four out of five people with autism tend to be male, right? So we talk about how it's an extreme left brain, um, like thinking. And it's almost like you concentrate, it's almost like you're a genius in this one area, but then the other parts aren't uh, working properly. And a lot of it has to do with social cues. So they, have, they tend to have a low EQ, emotional intelligence. So ASD symptoms seem to be poor communication among brain regions that normally work together to let us take another's viewpoint. So it's hard for them to see other people's perspectives. And there's a lot of research um, going into autism and 
so a lot of people want to know why are there so many more autistic people now than there were previously. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. So some of the causes might be that we you know that we think obviously research is still ongoing with this. Um, one could be biological factors, so genetic influences abnormal brain development. Uh, another thing could be genetic, or, or sorry, children exposed to high levels of testosterone in the room. Remember, testosterone is a male hormone. Uh, and then the last one is genetic mutated sperm producing cells. So going back to the question I just asked a minute ago, why are there so many more now, you know, people with autism now than there were even, you know, 20, 30 years ago? And there's a couple of theories behind this. Uh, some you know, possible things might be that now we just identify it more, right? So there were a lot more autistic people in the past, but we just didn't identify them as having autism. You know, we just kind of said they were weird or, you know, whatever it might be and just kind of cast them aside. It, it was taboo. Now we've identified what it is. And now there are people, I have a friend, you know, who goes into homes and, you know, they're identifying people with autism as early as like 18 months. And now you develop a behavioral plan with them so they, you know, can function at, um, in society and can contribute to society and don't have as many of those social issues because they've worked on it at a younger age. And then the other thing goes to, you know, the third one on the slide here talks about genetic mutated sperm producing cells. Well, if we're older having kids, right, the older a male is, the more mutated sperm they have, right? They produce millions and millions of sperm. Well, the older you are, the more mutated sperm you produce. It's just a higher likelihood that one of those mutated sperm would be the one who impregnated the woman and then causes autism. So moving on to modern tests. A couple of different types of tests that you need to know about. There's aptitude tests. These are tests designed to predict a person's future performance. So a lot of times for jobs, you have to take an aptitude test to kind of predict how well you will do at that job. So like I had to take one for teaching. There are achievement tests. This test used to assess what has been learned. An example would be like the unit test that you have to take at the end of this unit. That would be an achievement test. So a guy named David Wexler uh, created uh, the WAIS test. And what he tried to do is he tried to test more than just the verbal intelligence, which a lot of the other tests were doing. So his were broken down into verbal and performance areas. And he would give an overall intelligence score and he would separate them into different categories. So you get a separate score for your perceptual organization, your working memory and processing. So there's two types of tests. Uh, there's objective tests and subjective tests. So an objective test have one set answer that can be scored easily by a machine, right? So these are like multiple choice tests. Uh, these require convergent thinking because you just converge on to whatever the right answer is, right? A, B, C, D, or E. Now, there's also subjective tests. These are tests in which individuals are given ambiguous figures or an open-ended question which requires some interpretation and analysis. This would be like your FRQs that you have, right? Your free response questions. It's kind of open-ended. Even though I have a rubric, it's kind of open-ended on whether or not you answered it correctly. Uh, so this one requires like divergent thinking. Sometimes you have to like think outside the box. If you remember the, the video we talked about with divergent thinking last unit. So here's some sample subjective tests. Uh, Warshock. Warshock is a test we'll see a few times this year. So the Warshock ink block test is one of the most widely known and inaccurate subjective tests. So the following slides are going to be an example of uh, a Warshock, you know, the real Warshock ink block test. And so as we go through each slide, just try to think, what does it look like to you? And basically, so this is very subjective. It's open to interpretation. Uh, this has been used as a personality test, an intelligence test, and a test to see if you have a mental disorder based off your uh, responses. So after you, you know doing this test, we'll do it now. Uh, you know, see, do you think that would be accurate?
So just, you know, in your mind, or you can drop it down your notes, you know, what do you think this looks like? Some common answers are foxes. What about this one? Now, based off these answers, do you think someone can tell your intelligence? Maybe they'll look and see how creative you are. Some common answers for this one are people playing patty cake, you know, because it's right here. So you got two people playing patty cake. I think it kind of looks like a mask, right? You got the nose here, the eyes, kind of like Scarecrow from the Batman movies. What about this one? Think for a second. What do you think this looks like? So maybe if they're trying to see mental disorder, they're trying to see, um, or they did this to criminals, right? You know, are you giving a lot of violent type answers? You know, maybe that shows something about your personality or mental disorder. So common ones for this are two women sitting at like a cauldron, stirring something. So you see them kind of, that's their legs, that's their butt sticking out, that's their head, and they're stirring something. I kind of think it looks like a, like a skeleton, almost like a pelvis bone or maybe even a squirrel, and that's their, that's their skull, their nose, mouth, their arms, legs. What about this one? Some people might say like a moth type thing, and that's their head down here. I think it looks like a guy on a motorcycle, right? There's his boots sticking out. He's kind of riding a motorcycle. Here's his arms on the handlebars. What about this one? A lot of times people say butterflies, um, moss, something like that. This one usually gives the more unique answers. Um, it's a little bit more ambiguous. I like to think of like maybe this is a cross on top of a hill like they have in Rio or uh, I've seen at uh, Marseille in southern France. All right, so now going to the different theories of intelligence. Uh, we have Spearman, right? So there's a chart in your book that has these different theories. So make sure you know the different theories of kind of how intelligence works. So Spearman believed we had one general intelligence. He called it the G factor. Make sure you know that, the G factor, right? So he, pretty much he's saying if you're good at one thing, you're good at all things. And he used something called factor analysis. So this is a vocab word uh, we're going to have in this unit and in following units, right? So this is a statistical procedure that IDs cluster of related items. Similar to like, think of like the alg algorithms we talked about before. So Spearman thought that success in one area, such as verbal intelligence, would translate to other areas such as reasoning ability. So pretty much if you go at one thing, you tend to be good at all things. Uh, so just like, you know, if you tend to be a good student, you tend to get A's, A's and B's. You usually get A's and B's in pretty much all subjects. So if you get one thing, you tend to be good at all things. So as we go through these, think about, you know, which theory do you believe in? All right, so uh, Howard Gardner believed that IQ scores measured only a limited range of human mental abilities. He argued we have seven separate mental abilities he calls the multiple intelligences. And uh, since these seven, they've been added to um, to where there's a few more. And I kind of like this one because, you know, we all tend to be good at something, right? Um, so we might not be good at math or writing, but we all tend to have like our own, like our own intelligence. And that's why I kind of like this one because I think we all are good at something. So he broke it down to linguistic intelligence. That's like word smart. Uh, logical mathematical intelligence. That's like number or reasoning smart. Spatial intelligence. That's like picture smart. Bodily kinesthetic intelligence. That's like body smart. Uh, musical intelligence, that's music smart. Uh, interpersonal intelligence, that's people smart. And intrapersonal intelligence, that's self smart. So obviously, the last two people get confused a lot. Intra, that means like you understand yourself. Inter means like you understand other people, like you're very sociable. And so here are uh, a few other ones that people added and what type of jobs they tend to get. So 
I know they used to with like the PSAT and, and some of you guys have taken like a test and it tells you, oh, what type of jobs you would be good at. Essentially, you're taking like a multiple intelligence, like a Gardner multiple intelligence test. And depending on your answers, you know, this would be what you would be good at. So if we start with existential right here, you know, those are like your philosophers, your theorists. Uh, in, interpersonal. These are so these are people person. So these are your counselors, your politicians, a sale person. So you have to be good with people to have a job like that. Right. Essentially, that's all a politician is. They're just a salesperson. They're selling themselves. And a salesperson, a lot of time you're buying them, not necessarily the product. So intrapersonal, uh, you like, you know, you like to keep to yourself a little bit, maybe more of an introvert. So these tend to be more researchers, which you can do on your own, a novelist. Uh, a lot of novelists might, you know, go away and actually get a cabin somewhere by themselves so they can just focus on that. An entrepreneur, body kinesthetic, so good with good with your body. So you're talking about like athletes, you know, something where you're going to be physical with uh, firefighters, actors. So a lot of times, you know, actors have to be good uh, being able to manipulate their body depending on the role. Musical rhythmic, uh, musicians, composers, disc jockeys. A uh, disc jockey is actually a DJ. A lot of people don't know that. DJ stands for disc jockey. We have verbal linguistic. Uh, so these are people would be like journalists, teachers, lawyers. So good at speaking. Uh, then you have your logical, mathematical. These are your, your engineers, your programmers, your accountants. If I wasn't a teacher, I think I might be an accountant. I like, I like money. I like numbers. Math was always my best subject. And then we have our naturalists next. These are your environmentalists, your farmers, your botanists. And then lastly, we have visual spatial. These are like your navigators, sculptors, architects. Uh, the next theory of intelligence would be Sternberg, the triarctic theory of intelligence. So tri meaning three. So remember Sternberg, the triarctic, he had three parts of his theory of intelligence. So we have, he had analytical, uh, assessed by intelligence tests. They have a single right answer. Uh, this is good at predicting school grades. He also believed that part of your intelligence was creative, right? Shown through one's reaction to new situations and developing new ideas. And then the last part was practical, required for everyday tasks. May have multiple solutions seen in management and business situations. So I'm trying to think how long ago. We used to have something called the PSAE that when you were juniors, you'd have to take those two days. First day, you would take the ACT, not the SAT, and then the second day you take something called work keys, and that's what this one was. It was more like uh, real life, like job situations. How would you handle it? And some jobs make you take that test uh, as part of the application. I know in the South, uh, there's a high percentage of companies that make you take the test, right? And so those are more practical type tests, like what you do in situations. And there might be multiple right answers, but some are better than others. So a lot of job tests test you with that. So also with the create creativity, so just to break it down a little bit more in a little bit more detail, uh, the uh, creativity is the ability to produce new ideas, right? So if you're creating something, you're creating something new. You're not just repeating it or you don't just know something, right, that you read in a book, but you're being, you're able to create something new. And that's key. And the five criteria for that is uh, expertise, imaginative thinking skills, venturesome personality, intrinsic motivation, something we've talked about before and we're going to talk about it again, right? So this is being driven more by interest and satisfaction and challenge, right? So you're intrinsically motivated. You do it because you want to do it. You're not motivated by, by outside things. And the last thing, you know, creative environment. So usually if you're in a creative environment, that helps with your creativity, which we talked about during the learning unit with, you know, like 98% of five-year-olds scoring at the genius of their creativity, but only 2% by the time they graduate high school. So how do you find out how creative you are? Well, you take a test, of course, right? Uh, there's a test you take called the RAT test, right? So it stands for Remote Associations Test, the RAT test. And it just, they, they ask you a number of different questions and based off your answers, they can kind of tell how creative you are. I will uh, post to the playlist uh, 
a sample, some sample questions of those. And the last slide, uh, we talked about emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence nowadays is getting a lot more uh, notoriety than it used to. Emotional intelligence is actually a better indicator of how successful someone will be than their IQ. All right, so emotional intelligence is extremely important because we live in a very sociable world. So you have to understand uh, yourself and other people. So what is emotional intelligence? It's the ability to one perceive, right, recognize and you know emotions from other people. And obviously you got your chart there of all these different emotions. To understand emotions, right, that is to predict them and how they change and blend to manage your emotions, right? So express them in varied situations and use your emotions, right? Enable adaptive or creative thinking with your emotions. So you can see how this is very uh, important in different jobs, especially like think about being an actor, how you have to control all your emotions and stuff like that.